then unfortunately people aren't getting the message and they're not changing their habits and they're leaving food out for bears and it's keeping them in the community and they pay the ultimate price, as you know. This is Defender Radio. I'm Michael Howie, and this is Defender Radio, the podcast for wildlife advocates and animal lovers, brought to you by the Fur Bears. Bears are hungry right now, like super duper hungry. This time of year, they're getting ready for hibernation and are spending most of their time grabbing all the calories they can. And that means it's extra important to manage attractants and do what we can to keep them from hanging out in our neighborhoods. Even if we individually like having the bears in our yards, other neighbors may not. And having them grow comfortable around people can and will lead to other conflict. And despite available solutions, in BC, that often means they are killed by conservation officers. The North Shore Black Bear Society is working tirelessly within their community and others in BC to make sure municipal bylaws are in place and push for greater education and enforcement from governments. Their own work on education is also impressive, including traditional and social media, classroom visits, and more. To help us understand what bears are up to, the importance of changing our behaviors to protect them, and what attractants we may not be thinking about this time of year, Lucy Cadman of the North Shore Black Bear Society joined Defender Radio. And before I throw to the interview, I have to apologize. Lucy is recovering from a lingering flu, and I have an even greater ailment, the man cold. We both wanted to get this episode up and out due to the timeliness of it, so you may hear a couple of rough cuts where I removed a sniffle or cough. You'll also hear a few polite ahems from Lucy, and my voice dropping out followed by a quieted through editing hacking cough. Thanks for bearing with us. See what I did there? Anyway, here we go. What are bears up to this time of year in BC? Keep in mind that there's going to be some changes in behavior across the country and across the home range. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would think primarily just in terms of when some things happen, but what are they up to right now? Uh, So it's a very, very active time for bears as they prepare for winter dormancy. So they're active for about 20 hours a day in the fall, um, looking to to consume about 20,000 calories every single day in order to put on, on enough weight to survive the winter when there are no natural foods around. Uh, they're preparing their dens too, so uh, bears will spend weeks uh, searching for and preparing their dens for the winter. So here on the North Shore, a black bear den is most commonly under a big old growth, growth tree in the forest and a nice quiet place away from the trails. And uh, Bed dens are quite small. The entrances are very small. They want to keep as much heat in there as possible. But what they'll do is they'll take lots of foliage, lots of nice mosses into the den and prepare a nice, comfortable mattress. So they'll spend weeks and weeks doing that. And uh, lots of time in the community, unfortunately, this is the most active time for bears in the community as they look for the easy food rewards. And unfortunately, people aren't getting the message and they're not changing uh, their habits and the, they're leaving food out for bears and it's keeping them in the community and they pay the ultimate price as you know yeah and in september there was a a, a very high number of bears killed um mm-hmm. and this was by conservation officers in direct response yep. to so-called habituation uh not mm-hmm. including any bears that are hunted any bears who die as a result of uh, uh you know roadside mortality uh, or any of the other issues. How many bears were there in September that we know of killed by conservation officers? 109. And that's just insane that it's that it many. Uh, now, yeah. while we can debate whether or not those bears needed to be killed endlessly, uh, and we have, I, I think we need to focus on, again, the prevention. Uh, this is the message the Conservation Officer Service is publicly right now really pushing. They've done a Mm -hmm. media blitz, uh, and it looks like they're trying to be more proactive than they were earlier this year, which is nice to see. Um, What kinds of things are they telling people, and is it stuff? I mean, is this unreasonable things to ask of people, do you think? Or is it, yep, this is just what what it means to live among the bears? I don't think it's unreasonable to ask people 
to secure their garbage. I really don't. Um, to pick their fruit trees, if you decide to plant fruit trees, you need to be managing them properly. If you live in bear country, um, get into that fruit before the bear does. Many people think it's okay. Oh, the bears, it's only eating apples in my garden. That's absolutely fine. They come every year. Uh, well, it's not okay because that bear finds the apples, stays in the community and finds other food sources. Um, so we do have some bylaws on the North Shore. Um, in West Vancouver, attractants are under the bylaw. So anything that's attracting uh, black bears to the community, um, but whether that be bird sea or fruit trees, um, we do have bylaws for that, but these things aren't really being enforced and that's the issue. So we've got bylaws to protect wildlife and to protect people ultimately as well. We've got solid waste bylaws across the North Shore about keeping their garbage on your property until the very morning of collection. And uh, thankfully, um, in the district of North Vancouver, that is being heavily enforced and they did hire an, ag an auxiliary position this year um, from May to October um, to go out to check for cars at curbside overnight that's a big big issue here on the north shore yeah it's it, it it's surprising to me that and i guess i it's, it's hard for me to say i don't live in vancouver i live in hamilton we don't have that kind of bear um we have trash mm -hmm. pandas um yeah <laughs> and they, they present a different kind of issue but um out there it, it it is surprising to me that it's gotten to the point where a municipal district has hired a uh, an auxiliary officer. So someone to come in seasonally, I guess is the best way of putting that yeah. with the sole purpose of going around and checking the garbage. Like that's how significant the problem is. And if you've ever worked with or in or around municipal politics, getting someone hired is not an easy thing to do because there's budget yeah. issues and it's got a balance and one budget, like one person worth of budget can have a really big impact on the rest of the budget. So they don't take it lightly. Um, and that to me really like emphasizes how large of an issue a lot of people are seeing this as, but it still continues. Now, I, I know there's some people who simply at this point, it's hard to believe, but there are going to be some people who don't know or who may not understand fully the consequence oh, yeah. of their action. But what about Absolutely. those people? And you mentioned the ones who say, well, I like seeing the bears coming and getting my apples, or I enjoy having the bears in my backyard. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, we, we don't have bears in Hamilton. We do have all kinds of other wildlife. Uh, and I hear the same thing. So how do you, when you're, when you're having these conversations as an educator, how do you try and sort of, I don't want to say break down that wall, but it does feel very much like a mental wall of this is what I like, and I'm not going to change that. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a challenge. Um, typically, those people that like to see the bear, see like bears and uh, don't mind seeing them in the community, but we just try to emphasize the fact that that might, might be okay for you, but I can guarantee that the neighbors either side of you will not be happy that a bear is in the community. They'll be frightened. Uh, there's lots of misconceptions about bears, uh, particularly black bears, and uh, that fear will prompt people to call the conservation officers and um, if enough people call the issue will be addressed and unfortunately that issue is addressed by setting a trap and killing that bear um, so we have to be cool to be kind and that's why we're encouraging people to that if a bear is on your property don't just stand there and film it don't let the bear get comfortable in an urban environment it's not always food sources but it's our behavior to a few weeks ago, I had a beautiful bear wander through our garden. We live uh, right next to the forest at the base of the mountain. I know there's no food for that bear. Did I want to take a video? Absolutely, I did. But because I care about bears, I immediately just banged on the glass and scared that bear away. It's very easy to do. Very big bear ran over the fence. He, he couldn't wait to get out of there. So we give them a negative experience and teach them that it's not okay to be in the community. Um, and that's a big issue too, that people will just film and they want that photograph, they want that video, and then they let the bear become comfortable until it doesn't suit them. Yep. And the bear doesn't understand the consequences of being close to people. And yep. so it's about being cruel to be kind, isn't it? So yes, you don't mind the bear in your garden, but we know the consequences. Not a single bear in all of BC was relocated in September. 
So these traps that they set, they don't move bears. And that's the issue is that too many people still think that bears are being relocated. And even if a bear is moved, we had an issue. I don't know if I'd spoken to you um, at this point, but in the late spring, I think it was late spring this year, on a Sunday afternoon, a 15-year-old female bear was caught in one of those culvert traps. A tremendously hot day. It's a metal trap. She's trapped inside there for at least six hours, I could tell from the report. Um, that's because um, the conservation officers so understaffed that there was nobody to go and, and remove that bear for quite some time. So she was trapped in there. That was a Sunday night, and uh, she'd been tempted into the neighborhood by bird feeders, unsecured garbage, and then uh, she was taken away and killed. And on Monday, on that same street in West Vancouver, a very tiny street, about 50 houses, um, another bear was in the area. So we take a bear away, and it leaves a void that another bear will fill. And the cycle continues, just tempting them into the community and then killing them, leaving a space for another bear. Um, so this is what we want to get, to get out there, is that if a bear is removed, if people don't manage their attractants, another bear will come in. Yeah, and that's the exact same lesson we see with almost all wildlife. Um, uh, coyotes, uh, again, I do a lot of work on that issue. Uh, not an issue, it's the conflict people perceive with coyotes' presence. Uh, mm-hmm. But it's it's the same lesson of they're here because there's a reason for them to be here. Uh, exactly. y- yes, we can talk about habitat degradation. Um, and, and I don't know, it, it, in Ontario, um, it, it, you may remember it's... Uh, I'll, people will say down here in the Hamilton area or Niagara or the GTA, uh, they'll say, well, why don't we send the animals up to Algonquin, uh, which is mm-hmm. the big uh, park here. Um, yeah. And it, it it's this misconception that they either exist in pure wild or not at all. Um, and people forget that there is there's a lot of space for wildlife to exist around us. But we don't Absolutely. want them necessarily next to us or in our yards. Yeah. And yeah. it's, it's again, it's, it's a difficult conversation to have, I find. Yeah, I mean, because of the nature of where we are on the North Shore, we always say to people, it's absolutely normal to see bears wandering through the neighborhood here. Lots of creeks and green spaces run through the communities. We live in such a beautiful space. Um, but the bears will travel through. But if you leave food out, then they'll stay. That's the issue. And they'll stay as long as the food is available or until a trap is set and they're taken away and killed. And, uh, yeah, here on the North Shore, it's just it's just phenomenal. I'll see reports of bears being attracted to fruit trees and bird feeders in communities where we've done so much education. And uh, it's very, very discouraging. And uh, we hope hopefully um, we'll get more bylaws in place um, that address attractants other than just the garbage and the set out time that's the only one we've got at the moment in the district Um, because unfortunately if education doesn't work then we've got that tool of enforcement Um, and so we'd like to see that being used again it's about funding isn't it it's about having the funds to do that well and i think one of the difficulties in these conversations as well and again with my background of journalism uh, I spent a lot of time in around uh, both municipal and provincial and federal politics, but trying to deal with like to say in an ideal world, people wouldn't freak out when there's a bear and we could, mm-hmm. if they do come into the community, just usher them back out of the community. Um, the current reality, however, is that if these bears come into the community and stay whether or not we agree with it and whether or not it is ethically right or scientifically just, um, it is the reality is that conservation officers are going to come and they are very, very likely going to kill that bear. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's, again, that's another one of those little barriers of people saying it shouldn't be this way. And I agree, it shouldn't, but it is. And while we work towards it, to the world of it shouldn't be, we have to deal with what is. Um, and that's, it's, it, it is such a frustrating thing to have to say, uh, and sorry, now I have a frog in my throat. It's, mm-hmm. we're both sick and just, I'm going to, I'm going to mention this in the, the preamble, of course, but you and I are both <laughs> sick and I have drank an entire 16 ounce cup of coffee in the 14 minutes oh we've goodness. been talking. <laughs> I'm trying to mute me. that. Yeah. Lots of fun. So 
It is. I just, I guess it's, it's so frustrating. And one of the things I'd love to talk about briefly, uh, because this is something that we all need to be talking about regularly is how those of us who are passionate about this, those of us who work in the trenches like you do, emotionally managing the frustration, um, <laughs> I think is something that needs to be discussed. What do you and uh, and your colleagues at uh, North Shore Black Bear Society, how are you managing that? What steps do you take to make sure that you're able to next week be back there? Oh, well, maybe not next week if you're still sick, but... Um, Back, be able to get back on your feet nonetheless and say, yesterday was hard, today we got to do it again. Oh, wow. Well, it's it's definitely been a challenge, especially this year. Um, yeah, it's, it's been a, an incredibly frustrating year. Um, the communication between us as educators and the Conservation Officers Service has been very limited. Um, we'd like to work together essentially, um, on the, you know, being able to have information that enables us to provide education to more residents to reduce that conflict and reduce the number of bears that are being killed. But just every day, it's just, it's a big responsibility to be the voice for these animals on the North Shore. And the fine school presentations really uplift me. Um, when I go and meet the next generation of homeowners and we talk about our responsibilities and we take some of those irrational fears away. So um, working with children definitely helps um, bring the positivity back and, and some hope um, for future change. Definitely. And young people are so much more willing to adapt, I find, too. Oh, Ma yes. Maybe not when it comes Absolutely. for what's for dinner, but when it comes to <laughs> if you say and you show them, this is a bear and they love bears who all kids love animals to some degree, whether it is their teddy bear or a real bear. Um, yeah. And when you tell them bad things are going to happen to this bear, unless mm -hmm. we make a change. I mean, that, that mm -hmm. was the, the, the Lorax. I have that on my bookshelf three feet away from me right now. Uh, mm -hmm. And how old is that book? Like, it's not a new lesson, but children adapt to that so much more quickly. Coyote Watch Canada has done amazing school presentations and it, when you enable children, when you empower them, that's the word, to be part of a solution to help animals, they get right behind it. It is so inspiring to see. And it, it begs the question, why can't grownups do that? I know. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely managing the people. That's, that's the challenge. And, um, you know, we have, I have so many people that say to me, oh, I know that the bird feeder will attract the bear, but I'll just take it down when the bear comes. Yeah. So, yeah, and then you provide solutions, alternatives to that, instead of hanging bird feeders, feed a small amount on a plate when you home to enjoy the birds. And you try and offer these solutions, but some people are very set in their ways. But ultimately, that, that will get a bear killed. And um, we want people to understand that and if they don't change the habits we want to see enforcement now that bears are getting ready for hibernation just to loop back to this are there any specific things uh we know fruit trees we know garbage those are two of the big ones that we talk about this time mm -hmm. of year garbage yeah. all your fruit trees especially now as you said they're active 20 oh, yeah. hours a day I have not been active for, I think, more than six hours a day in the last 20 years. <laughs> so I can imagine how hungry they are. Uh, yeah. What other uh, attractants should we be looking at? Bird feeders, I know, is one that's not talked about enough. Uh, and people get very, very defensive of bird feeders. What yeah. else is in a backyard that we should be looking for? Dirty barbecues. Uh, that comes up quite a lot. Lots of people, too, have outdoor fridges or freezers that they might store in a carport area. So... At least one bear this year was killed on the North Shore for accessing an outdoor freezer. Another bear was even killed for getting into an outdoor pantry. I don't know what an outdoor pantry is, but uh, uh, that was the cause of one bear being killed this year on the North Shore. So uh, things like that. Pumpkins now will be attracting yep. bears much too close to our doors. And all these things um, increase risk. All these uh, food sources that we leave out bring the bears much closer to our homes and it increases the risk of a negative encounter. So if you don't care about bears, care a little bit about the risk. Um, the risk of a black bear attacking you. Black bear attacks are incredibly rare. But when we leave food out, it increases that risk. So 
some people are afraid of bears and they still leave food out. I don't quite understand that. You're asking the bear really to come into your community when you leave food available. Yeah, it's it's surprising to see. Um, and one of the things I find interesting is I've encountered black bears in Nova Scotia, uh, northern Ontario. Oh, excuse me, geez. northern Ontario. I'm sorry, listeners. Uh, northern Ontario and British Columbia, um, where I've spent time. And every time I've encountered a black bear in those three provinces, as soon as the bear sees me, they are running in the other direction, not stopping and watching literally turning and running uh and that's without me making noise or doing anything they don't wow. want to be around us most of the time mm -hmm. uh, and i think the example you gave of just rapping on the glass of your window uh scares yeah. them away and i think we, we need to understand and and i often will try and use dogs as a behavioral example um when you have a scared dog and you want them to come to you three things we do is we make ourselves small, we make ourselves quiet, and we offer them food. Um, and we need to do the exact opposite when we don't want them to come near us. And that's, again, that's the example I use with coyotes, but it's it's the same with black bears. Um, and I think one of the other things talking about the, the potential harm is rather than not just potential harm to an individual, but when you see one of these bears who becomes conditioned to come into a neighborhood and look for food, and is encouraged to do so repeatedly, they start escalating the amount of risk they'll take. And that's exactly. when you hear about yeah. them, as you said, getting into a pantry, which I also, that I, I why, what, just why? That's my question to that. But um, they get into pantries and then they'll get into freezers and then they'll smell something from inside a house. And in British mm -hmm. Columbia, where it's never cold and I hate you all, people, uh, <laughs> you maybe just leave the screen door open. And yep. the bear smells your garbage or your food. And that's when we start seeing these photos of a bear getting into a cabin, a house, a vehicle, and tearing them apart. Uh, they're not doing anything wrong in their minds. They're just looking for a snack. But for our personal property, you can lose a lot of property. You can have a ton of property oh, yeah. damage because you have taught a bear to do it. You've taught the bear to come into these neighborhoods. You've taught the bear to follow their nose and take extra risks. And that's one of the consequences. Absolutely. Yeah, the behavior. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, that's what happened. And it's happened a couple of times um, on the North Shore that a bear's entered a property this year. And that behavior escalated from, um, it was a community that's very close to a regional park here. And people were going into the park and they were climbing, um, which isn't legal actually in that in the area, but um, they were climbing and leaving their backpacks full of food down at the base. And the bear was finding that food. And then the bear started to get comfortable around people in the park because people would get very close and approach the bear to take photographs. Um, quite certain too that people were feeding that bear. Then the bear gets more comfortable around people, starts to spend time in the community in the daytime. And then eventually, as you said, enter the property. Um, people went inside the kitchen, but they left the door wide open. They were at the front of the house. And the bear wandered in, took some food and left, but was later uh, caught and, and shot. So the behavior does escalate. And I hate when people say that the bear broke into the garbage enclosure. Well, the bear doesn't know it's breaking in. It yeah. smells something. Um, it smells a nice treat and it's very capable of, uh, of getting into um, storage areas very easily. They've got sharp claws and they're very, very strong. Um, so that's when the behavior escalates. Yeah, and that's the 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 issue with language that I'll often talk about. And one of the articles I'm going to plan on writing um, either today or tomorrow or maybe into early next week, I saw a person was walking with an off-leash dog uh, and a bear responded to that. And yeah. it's interesting because the headline still says person survives bear attack, even though they were fined for having their dog off leash and provoking it. And yeah. that's just, I mean, that's not what we're talking about today, but that is just, it's a great example of how the language we use indicates mm -hmm. how we're perceiving a problem. Uh, and that's a, what you said is a perfect example too, is they're not breaking in. They're just following their, like if I go through a drive through at Tim Hortons, am I breaking into Tim Hortons? <laughs> No, I'm going through the drive through It's all about how we perceive it and present it. Uh, exactly. Yeah, there was an article actually um, posted on one of our local papers. And um, I was quite alarmed when I saw the headline. It was something like 
uh, bear attacks gardener's shoe yeah. or, or guard, you know, and uh, there was there's no gardener attached to the shoe. It was just a shoe in a garden. Uh, but I was uh, in a panic thinking that uh, somebody had been attacked. That's definitely how these things are worded. <laughs> yes, that's uh, a just very poor journalism at that point, too. Um, now, to wrap up, we've talked about all the things people should be looking for. We've talked about the reality Uh, Again, not the ideal, but the current reality of what happens when bears are invited into communities by attractants and stay in communities because of attractants. Mm -hmm. We've talked about what individuals can do around their home. What can you do, though? And I think this is maybe one of the biggest things we need to get out there. What do I do if my neighbor has a bird feeder and I've said to them Mm -hmm. or I've left them a letter and said, hey, you're attracting bears and that's going to be a problem and they don't listen. What's my best step in that situation um well if you speak to somebody and they don't respond then i would get in touch um, with the local bylaw department to see if there's anything that that would cover and then beyond that if they actually are attracting wildlife to the community i would report that to the conservation officer service they've got the wildlife act they can find people for attracting what they consider to be dangerous wildlife into an urban environment unfortunately that's uh it has to be that way. It has to be fine for people that won't change the habits. And uh, one of the things I, I worry about, and we have a lot of conversations about, um, and I see a lot of commenting online, both on the fur bears and elsewhere, is people saying they won't call conservation because mm-hmm. uh, they'll just come and kill the animal. And that's maybe why we should call before the animals start showing up. So if you live in an area with bears or if the case happens to be coyotes or whatever other wildlife and you Mm -hmm. see someone with attractants, call before it becomes a problem. Yeah, absolutely. Um, If the conservation officers want to be proactive, as they're suggesting on social media, um, then they will address those, those issues before the bear is in the community. Absolutely. And that's what it should be. Uh, the, the issue is that they're so understaffed here and, and on the North Shore, the Sea to Sky Corridor, which is about 5 million people. We sometimes only have five officers um, during peak times of the year, which is why bears get left in traps for hours. And I've even heard days. I don't know if that's true, though, but I know for sure hours. So it's an issue of them not being able to use the enforcement tools that they've got. And the bears that they manage aren't being treated in a humane way. Uh, And that's the issue. And we're quite happy to state that we've got an issue with how bears are are being treated here in British Columbia. Yeah. And despite all of our problems with the Conservation Officer Service um, throughout the years and our ongoing debates about how they are organized and oversight and whatnot, um, which they intentionally misrepresent in the media, but I won't get into that, um, One of the issues is they are chronically underfunded and there simply aren't enough because you can see how much of an issue bears are just spring, summer, Mm -hmm. fall, but that's not their only responsibility. They are responsible for a lot of enforcement. Um, And I think one of the reasons we do see a lot of these problems and one of the reasons we get into the conflicts with the organization is because there simply aren't enough boots on the ground. And we see that in all manner of law enforcement. If we Mm -hmm. want them to be able to respond proactively, we do need more of them. Of course, we also need them to be well-trained and have oversight, but it is an issue. Uh, And we're not here to talk about the Conservation Officer Service directly. But I am very glad that uh, North Shore Black Bear Society is being vocal about the proactive needs. And I think that's, you know, what a lot of this is focused on. And hopefully people will take these lessons seriously and in 2020, we'll see a real change, both in the communities and with how the province is handling this. I really hope so. Um, We've written to the government. We're saying the same things as you guys. We're definitely on board with the Fur Bearers campaign of uh, more funding for the municipal um, staff and for the Conservation Officer Service so that we can do more proactive education, more enforcement uh, if that's needed. And we don't want another year like this. It's just been absolutely devastating. Since April, I um, added up that 496 bears have been killed since April, just in British Columbia by the Conservation Officer Service. And only six in all that time were translocated. So we've got to let people know it's not happening. Bears aren't being moved. If you leave food out for them, they will be shot and killed. As simple as that. 
To learn more about the North Shore Black Bear Society, visit NorthShoreBears.com or look them up on social media. I have to send a huge thank you to Lucy for sticking through this interview with me. Her dedication to the Bears of BC is incredible, and she whined significantly less about being sick than I did. I, of course, also need to thank all of you for listening and putting up with our maladies. Please look me up on Facebook and Twitter at The Fender Radio and on Instagram at Howie Michael to see some fun posts of things like my editing process, upcoming interviews, contests, and as always, adorable photos of JJ the Hamilton Hound. Until next time, presuming the man cold doesn't do me in, I'm Michael Howie for Defender Radio and the Fur Bears reminding you to be kind and to stay informed and stay strong. (laughs) 